Dear ladies and gentlemen, a cordial welcome on the live conference uh, on the securing of health and social systems for future generations. I would like to start with a historical questions. Do you prefer to be lucky or would you rather be brilliant? I do not want to respond on that. But what I can say is that the members of the German social insurance are both. On the one hand, they are very lucky because this year, uh, this week, they have been very lucky with this topic. It was also the World Health Conference, the European Health Conference, and obviously the topic COVID-19 was the most important on both of these conferences. And of course, they are brilliant as well. They don't only have set the framework of the EU Council presidents for this conference, but they have also very early decided to swap to a digital format for this conference. And dear ladies and gentlemen, watching us from the internet can also participate in this event. And during this second Corona wave, we have also set up two different locations for this conference. We live in very exciting times. We always have to have a plan A and also a plan B. And sometimes it is actually plan C that is being implemented. The corona pandemic is something that we experience, all of us. It is a big challenge for our society, for health and social systems. And many questions have been raised during these times and have also been decided on because of that challenge. Health and social systems have been affected by this situation and uh, we hope that we will actually be able to exit this pandemic at some point. But even then, this will, this will mean adaptation adjustments to the health and social systems. This is what we're going to talk about today with two important topics. It is important to lead the path into the future now, not only with regards to Corona. And obviously, this requires us to discuss uh, certain points. And this is what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about the environment of uh, the medication industry this year. What kind of bottlenecks do we have? Do we need new regulations? But on, this, on the other hand, Corona has also shown where in a very short period of time, we had to move into our home office. And those people who work, uh, who are platform workers, in what way are they, uh, do they receive social security? This is what we're going to talk about this afternoon. You have also realized that you can attend this event in the German or the English language. And that means uh, a lot of work both here in Brussels and in Berlin. We are here in uh, Brussels at the representation of the uh, statutory health insurance. Uh, and today we are going to have a lot of important events. The German Chancellor is going to meet the uh, Prime Ministers of the Federal States in order to decide on new measures. And now we are going to move to our next location, and that is the Rue Montoyer in uh, Brussels. This is uh, where we have a few other panelists, but uh, also Mark Weinmeister, the State Secretary, uh, the Hessian State Secretary for European Affairs. And uh, I would like to hand, hand over to you now. Yes, thank you very much. And I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to welcome you for this 
conference. This would have been one of my first visits to Brussels after the lockdown in March, and I was very much looking forward to this high-caliber event. Unfortunately, due to the current situation, we have had to move to a different format. As it happens all over Europe, we had to move to a video conference. Nonetheless, it is great that we can, even during those difficult times, hold a digital events such as this one. And therefore, a huge thank you to the Federal Ministry for Labor and Social Affairs uh, so that we were able to hold this event, but also a huge thanks to Ms. Wölfle, who has organized this high caliber panel and uh, who has had a lot of efforts uh, together with uh, her team of the European representation. As the Hessian state representation, our European office, has for a long time been a very important contact uh, partner, not only during times of COVID, but also beyond. Social insur insurance is for us something that belongs to our uh, constitution. The social insurance system has evolved um, since its launch in 18 1983 and has strengthened and it, it has been one of the main uh, reasons for uh, peace and and social security uh, for our citizens and it has been made clear how important it is for our national but also European um, cohesion it is important uh, to have compatible social security systems in the individual member states, but also through the Treaty of Lisbon, a loads of new paths had been uh, had been uh, started and also the uh, launch of the social pillar of, of uh, Juncker um, has been uh, something uh, that has set an important standard in this area. Therefore, I'm very grateful for the event to be able to happen today and we are glad to be to be to be able to have such uh, highly competent contact uh, details and uh, if we talk about uh, contact partners and if we talk about obviously i'm not only uh, talk about uh, male contact partners but we have dr pfeiffer uh, frau rosbach and frau um, höller they are all uh, very important uh, contact partners who are very important in uh, this domain, who um, have launched, of launched a lot of important projects in that area. On the topic itself, we have already mentioned that the two um, main topics of today. The uh, provision of medication, this is something that obviously in HES we pay a lot of attention to, not only to be able to provide medication to our citizens, but also because we have a very important uh, chemistry industry in HES and these are very important uh, value creation pillars. And we see ourselves as the pharmacy of Europe. And therefore, we have to pay attention to the European collaboration in this area and how together we can tackle the challenges, not only of the corona pandemic, but also beyond that. Myself, I have been a member of the Committee of the Regions. Two weeks ago, we have decided on a statement on the topic of digitalization, obviously also digitalization in the labor world, and the question, how can we use digitalization? And in that uh, with that regard, we have put a lot of emphasis on the human being at the center of it. Digitalization can create simplification uh, for our lives, but we should not uh, forget about the human being that should be at the core of it. And obviously, it's important to have social security. This will be the second topic of our conference today. And uh, in my statement, 
I actually put a lot of emphasis on this, and therefore I am looking forward to the discussions on that topic. I wish you a lot of success for the conference, and I'm looking forward to being able to see you not only virtually, but also physically in the near future. Thank you very much, and all the best. Thank you, Mr. Weinmeister. You have uh, definitely spoken a lot of important words. And at the moment, we live with Corona. And unfortunately, we have to be separated. But thanks to digital technologies, we can actually come together. We have uh, these three big, uh, these three big uh, complexes, the European New uh, Green Deal, medication and digitalization. And now we have Ilka Wölfle, who has been the uh, director of European Social Insurance in uh, Brussels. And hopefully the team spirit um, that is also a very important pillar of their team will be um, also a pillar for our topics today. Thank you, Ms. Jemuk, uh, dear members of parliament, dear guests. I would like to welcome you uh, on the current event. I would have loved to be able to welcome you personally today, but we all know that due to the current situation, this is unfortunately not possible. But technology can overcome all barriers nowadays and also between Brussels and Berlin, as we heard today. I'm very thankful that we have the necessary methods in order to hold this event nonetheless today. Therefore, a very big thank you to the state representation of HESS in Brussels and also the um, National um, Health Insurance Association in Berlin. Corona has obviously had a huge influence on our topics. The pandemic has actually opened up a lot of new topics. In that case, we have also noticed this a lot in terms of the health industry during the pandemic. Uh, a lot of material was lacking, for example, masks, single-use gloves and others. But also important medication was lacking that was important to maintain healthcare. Therefore, today in our first panel, we would like to discuss the question how the provision of medication can be secured, can be ensured for future generations. With that regard, we are going to talk about three important topics. First of all, the availability of medications, second, access to medication for patients, and third, the avoidance of dependency uh, when producing active ingredients. Strategic independence of Europe of international producers has been mentioned again and again, also from the Social, Sec uh, Social Security Organization. Should we only want to produce medication in Europe from now on, we will have to ask ourselves wh whether this is going to be possible. And of course, what is that going to cost? It is important since prices have risen a lot, especially for innovative medication, and especially those prevent people uh, from having no or limited access to important treatments. But they also pose a danger for the uh, possibility of funding of healthcare systems. With the insurance of the financing, this is something that we're going to talk about this afternoon. And obviously, I'd be very glad if you're going to participate in that event as well. How can we ensure um, these affordable prices for medication also at a European level. I'm sure that we are going to hear a lot of solution approaches in the upcoming discussions. And with that, I'm going to hand back over to Ms. Cimok and I'm looking forward to a very interesting uh, conversation. 
Thank you, Ms. Wölfle. You are going to um, stay with us and you are going to present uh, the second part from Brussels here in Berlin. We are going to look over to Brussels where we have our first keynote speaker and on that uh, way I'm also going to present the structure of the panels. We are going to have an impulse uh, keynote and following that we are going to discuss this topic with a few panelists and with that we are also going to ask you during these panels. Uh, we are going to pose a question that you can respond to. This is what's going to happen towards the end. And now we're going to start. Medication for future generations. How can we ensure the uh, provision and uh, also, also with that regard, we're going to talk about Corona since Corona has actually made clear where do we have weak points. For example, international supply chains, they exist, they are a part of the system, but if they don't work, then uh, this can actually pose challenges. In the automotive sector, this is possibly not that dramatic, if not all parts can be delivered, but in the area of medication production, uh, this can actually have life-threatening consequences. Europe should therefore be able to structurally tackle these challenges and we have a lot of more items that we're going to discuss but first of all i know that our keynote speaker is already waiting and i would like to present him timo Wölke is a member of the parliament for four years um, in the Progressive Alliance of uh, Social Democrats. He is a member of several committees, but he also focuses on environmental matters, legal matters, and uh, digital matters. These are all topics that we have already talked about, so we couldn't have a better keynote speaker for our conference today. And I hope that you uh, are going to share your impulse with us now. Thank you. Okay, I hope everyone can hear me. We've all had a bit of time to practice working with technology. I would like to thank Ms. Wölfle and her team for the organization. Thank you very much for inviting me to today's conference. In recent months, the issue of pharmaceutical bottlenecks and thus security supply has been a major focus of our work. It was only in the September plenary week that we adopted an own initiative motion on this subject. Medicines play an important role in the treatment of diseases, that's crystal clear. Universal access to high quality health care at affordable costs for individuals and society is not only a basic need, it is one of our common values and principles and is enshrined in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. So this once again underlines the extreme importance. Everyone has the right of access to preventative health care and the right to benefit from medical treatment. This also means access to essential medicines. Unfortunately, there's an echo. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown us that the union needs to become more resilient and act together in crisis situations. We have seen many uncoordinated initiatives at national level, such as building up national stocks of medical supplies, closing borders or introducing export bans. And this certainly wasn't helpful. This was obviously not the right solution and may lead to an increased risk of shortage of medicines. And at this point, I must also praise the industry, by the way, Thanks to the close cooperation with the Commission and Member States, the worst was avoided and constructive cooperation was established. The consequences for patients due to bottlenecks can be quite serious. Del delays in treatment can cause diseases to progress or symptoms to worsen. It can also lead to unnecessarily prolonged hospitalization and cause considerable stress for patients and their families. One of the reasons for bottlenecks 
and supply disruptions is that the supply chain of medicines has become longer, more complex and more fragmented as companies have located parts of their pharmaceutical production outside of the European Union. But it is not only the complexity of the supply chains that make uh, strategic decisions made by pharmaceutical companies uh, can cause problems. For example, they decide where to put which drug on the market. And let's face it, it's usually the most profitable, ma profitable markets. Pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies decide what they want to research and whether a product or, ma or, or market is profitable or not. And so products are sometimes no longer manufactured because they are simply no longer profitable. And this is especially a big issue in the area of antibiotics. And the COVID pandemic has also reminded us once again how dependent the EU supply of medicine is on third countries. Now we are all talking about the need to bring the production of medicines back to the EU in order to reduce dependency. But I think none of us is so naive as to believe that legislation will immediately stop all production in third countries and open new production facilities in the EU. We must ensure that the EU as a production location becomes attractive for new production sites. So we must create legislative incentives so that companies want to come back to the European Union. And we, of course, need to secure a production capacity. A variety of different approaches can be taken. In my view, one of the most important areas for action is the obligation for industry to report bottlenecks quickly and in good time so that we have planning security. We must give the EMA, the EMA more powers and better resources because it can be the authority that warns of bottlenecks in essential medicines. When awarding, when awarding contracts, we must no longer focus solely on price, but on the price performance ratio. I also think it is important that when awarding contracts, attention is also paid to the fact that there is more than one location for production. This ensures that if one production facility no longer produces, we have um, bottlenecks, which is why I think it is very important that we pay attention to a good setup. So we are faced with a whole lot of different tasks, and I do hope that the European Commission will, with its pharmaceutical strategy, strategy which is scheduled for the 24th of November, will actually come about with potential solutions, which of course we would love to further develop and implement in the European Parliament. Thank you. Just a brief comment. I'm not sure if you also watch the stream simultaneously. We heard a slight echo in the meantime. Maybe uh, it would be possible to try and sort that out during our discussion. But we are now going to launch into our discussion. We have already asked all our panelists uh, beforehand what are uh, for them the three most important aspects to ensure uh, the systems for the future, and that is uh, regarding the health and social systems in general. And you have already seen that. Uh, I am not alone here in Berlin. Um, I have been joined by the director, uh, Dr. Doris Pfeiffer, of the National Statutory Health Insurance Network. Thank you very much for hosting this event today. What, for you, are the most important uh, challenges with regard to that topic? Well, we uh, have been uh, confronted with a very specific challenge. We have mentioned this already quite a lot, but I think we have to mention it once again. In Germany, so far, the pandemic has been tackled relatively well in comparison with other neighboring countries. And if you look at it from a national standpoint, and this probably applies also to the other member states, and that uh, means that our preparation for a pandemic situations such as that one wasn't sufficient. We didn't have enough protective equipment. Uh, we didn't have sufficient plans and not a red ready to be implemented. In Germany, at least, we 
have only had very little uh, transparent capacities. We have just uh, started to open up a register for intensive uh, beds. Uh, how many of these uh, beds in intensive care stations are still available? This is something that other member states have already introduced. In Germany, we are still in the process of setting this up. And also the public health care system um, we haven't. We have underfunded a public health uh, system in Germany. This is a discussion that we've had for decades in Germany. So, in that regard, we have a lot of requirements for modernization in terms of capacities and so on. This, these were items where the pandemic has shown us that we have a lot of deficits. At a European level, we obviously also have the topic of uh, protective equipment, which uh, has uh, actually been talked about a lot. And uh, we have uh, realized that we don't, uh, we, that we haven't had a well thought through strategy with regards to that. We uh, have also had the question of uh, vaccinations. Thankfully, an, initi an initiative at a European level has has been launched with regards to that. How we ca how can we promote the development of a vaccination? And uh, hopefully, we are going to have that uh, next year. In addition to that, and that is the specific topic today, is the topic of the um, ensuring the provision of medication. Also with that regard, we need more transparency on the distribution. This is what we're going to talk late, about later on. But one more item that is very important for myself is the uh, insurance of the uh, provision of the healthcare system in general. This is something that we talk about also at a European level. The access to social benefits, um, to be able to keep up, to maintain the system, but also maintain the possibilities of funding this system. Uh, this is uh, also about reducing inequalities, stabilizing uh, the area of uh, Medication, but also healthcare treatment in general. Uh, and obviously, all these areas work hand in hand. Uh, the question of solidarity has definitely been lacking um, over the first few months. Um, this has been improved. Now we are in the second wave, but we are going to talk about this later on. Now I would like to hand back over to Brussels, and we are going to move into the English been with the EU for the last 18 years. Half of that time, he's actually been a very busy man as head of unit health strategy and international in uh, DG Santé. Um, and right at the moment, he is extremely busy because he's probably writing the last sentences or polishing the last sentences um, of the new pharma strategy, which is supposed to come out on the 24th of November. Now, Silva, um, could you just sort of uh, kick off again with this uh, challenge to the general health systems, not so much this pharma uh, strategy. We're going to get back to that later on. And maybe you'd like to reflect a little bit on what we've just said about the European solidarity or the lack thereof in the first couple of months. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Can thank you hear you. me well? Absolutely. Can you confirm, please, that you hear me well? Absolutely. Perfect. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for inviting me. So, you know, very much like uh, the previous speakers, I think uh, the three uh, sort of lessons uh, learned and which in a way are also uh, guiding um, uh, principles for future action, uh, uh, they, they, are, they, they, are, they, they are what we've already said. So first, um, indeed, uh, increase uh, the tools that we have in common at EU level to address the uh, uh, crisis collectively and to respond uh, to health crisis collectively and to uh, prepare for the future crisis more collectively collectively than we've shown in this current crisis, where indeed fragmented responses and the temptation to work separately um, from the other EU countries has led to uh, divergent policy measures and to unnecessary border restriction. So we need to reinforce the instruments that we have as um, the 
uh, president of the commission announced in the State of the Union speech a few weeks ago in the European Parliament, we're going to soon come out with proposals on how to, in particular, reinforce the tools on uh, managing crisis, um, the tools that uh, provide for coordination between member states' authorities. But also, um, we will propose to reinforce the capacities of the agencies, uh, being the um, the, the Communicable Disease Center uh, based in Stockholm, ECDC, uh, which is our epidemiology hub, and also uh, the uh, European Medicines Agency uh, that uh, uh, has a role in coordinating the EU regulatory system across uh, across countries um, in, in the EU. So we're going to re and then also the the president announced that we will later, in the course of the next few years, look at putting in place a structure similar to what exists in the US to try to, it's called BADA, um, a, a bio, bio um, research and development agency that will actually hopefully be a tool that will then in the future also can steer the way we prepare and response to crisis. The second element or we also mentioned just by the previous speaker, I think of the lessons learned is that we've also seen with this crisis how important health systems and health coverage and health insurance and social protection are um, as, as, a, as a basis for um, uh, uh, economic prosperity and and social cohesion um, and that it, this is actually very important to ensure resources and capacity and investment um, in health systems both primary care and hospital care and and then the accompanying social protection and health insurance to ensure that uh, our society are robust enough and resilient enough to um, resist to crisis like this one and more generally to some of the structural challenges that are affecting our health systems, uh, just mentioning the demographic challenges and the aging of the population in particular and some of the other changes that goes together. The third point I mentioned is specifically on pharmaceuticals where I think, as he was already said by uh, Mr. Vulcan, the crisis has shown that a certain number of vulnerabilities that existed um, in the, in the uh, EU pharmaceutical system um, uh, were highlighted even more. And uh, these are those that we uh, intend to indeed address in the uh, pharmaceutical strategy. They relate to the availability of medicines and the shortages that have become uh, systemic in some countries, the security of supply, the continuity of supply, the accessibility to certain innovative products, but also the, the possibility to continue to access older products, um, the question of the capacity of the innovation model to actually address um, unmet needs and health systems needs and to actually provide the treatment and vaccines that are needed and the affordability for patient and also the value for money for health systems and all these challenges will be uh, part of the different uh, uh, or will be the the challenges that we will try to address in the uh, commission uh, uh, pharmaceutical strategy we'll propose in november and we'll propose measures and actions um, uh, both legislative and non-legislative and cooperation um, to address this challenge thank you Thank you very much, Sylvain. And uh, um, with that, we'll stay in Brussels uh, uh, and we'll switch again uh, to Jim. Uh, Dr. Dr. Gunther Siedl is, has been a member of the European Parliament for one year with very different focal points as his colleague Wolken. They came from Austria with um, uh, a lot of uh, work into the European Parliament. And dear Dr. Günther Siede, we'd uh, like to hear about your opinion and your analysis of the three most important points. If you could share that with us, please. Yes, thank you very much for inviting me to this very important event and uh, a huge thank you also to the, for the very good preparation and the exciting exchange with the European representation of the uh, German social insurance. At the beginning of this pandemic, we have seen um, what um, individual 
um, behavior and no sol solidarity uh, between countries can uh, lead to. The um, supply, uh, the insurance of provision wasn't guaranteed and the answer um, that we have received from that is we need more of Europe. Many people have also looked towards Europe to find out what are the measures of Europe. And uh, during the most recent European elections, we have seen um, higher participation in the elections because people want more European involvement. Uh, and also during this pandemic, people have looked towards Europe, but Europe hasn't, in the beginning, hasn't been able to help. People have to feel that uh, Europe can actually help them and therefore we need a very strong social pillar and a social pillar that uh, would also mean a shifting of, of competences in the healthcare systems towards Europe. But it also means that we have to move away from this just-in-time thinking um, and at the beginning, um, the effort of the Commission was very clear to order protective equipment and uh, to and for the member states to be to be able to help each other with regards to ventilators and so on. And that was not the case. Therefore, we have to implement these kind of measures into legislation. It also means that we shouldn't need to have discussions about uh, the, the question, how many intensive care beds do we have in our hospitals? How many, how much protective equipment do we have in store? We have also seen during this uh, pandemic that those member states who have a well-functioning healthcare system have actually been able to move through this pandemic in a much better way. And therefore, it is important that the public healthcare sector has to be strengthened also in the long term. And privatization, especially during these kind of times, is not the right answer. It has already been mentioned during these times. We have to ask ourselves the questions, how can we uh, ensure more production of medication in the EU? How how can we make the EU an attractive location for manufacturers? The question has to be, how can we achieve that as a European Union and as the member states to create uh, an exciting environment uh, for production locations, to move their production locations into Europe? And this is something uh, that will be a very important uh, question, also about research and development that, uh, that we have to uh, fund uh, to an increasingly extent. We cannot yet see the consequences of this pandemic and therefore we have to, we have to raise the question, how can this be funded? The fact that we want to make Europe more attractive as a production location and therefore Europe not only has to ask itself the question, how can we do that? But how can we also fund all these measures? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, for your contribution at the beginning. Uh, we are going to have a few more quicker answers later on, but now we are going to have to roll out the red carpet in English once again. Natalie Moll is going to talk to us uh, as the Director General of the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations. And uh, you have uh, both big pharma, small companies, you have all kinds of associations uh, all under your belt so you must actually reflect uh, and hear every day um, what your members uh, are saying what they're suffering from or where they want to go in future so uh, Natalie please share with us uh, your analysis of the three most important uh, turning points thank you so much uh, also for the thank invitation so much, yeah. to participate today um, I think that indeed there are lots of learnings from this crisis that we are still having today, unfortunately, um, through the second wave that we're living through. Um, the learnings 
that we had to implement very quickly was the importance of having a preparedness plan for critical medicines and the need for regulatory flexibility thanks to this, uh, thanks to the fact that companies already engaged their pandemic preparedness plan since December 2019. We have not had any shortages of medicines um, during the COVID pandemic until today. Um, as you know, the innovative industry is not um, dependent on um, imports of active ingredients from the rest of the world. We produce about 77% here in Europe and uh, import 11% from the US. So we're in a, in a good uh, state there. We also learned a lot about the importance of understanding and having transparency of member state demand in terms of what patients actually needed so that um, the issue is not just producing and supplying more medicines, it's also about getting the right medicines to the right hospital in the right country at the right time and having a very clear picture of what is likely to be needed in any um, future waves of the pandemic. Um, we also um, have a very strong need for current and forward-looking epidemiological data, so how the, um, any health threat is evolving so that we can plan, of course, uh, and make sure that we supply all member states uh, that need it in the way that they need it. Have this transparency of the supply chain um, very clear and use anything that we have in our, in our um possibility to find out where medicines are and make sure that they reach the patients who need them. And then, you know, underpinning everything, of course, the biggest lesson learned is the need for member state solidarity. So at the beginning, as was mentioned also by other speakers, uh, the biggest hurdles to making sure everyone had what they needed, whether it was personal protective equipment or medicines, was the fact that there was not yet an organized way of ensuring the movement of goods in Europe, in a Europe that was locking down, in a Europe that had um, borders closing that had export bans. And I think we all learned together, um, thanks to the crucial role of the European Commission, the European Medicines Agency, to ensure that solidarity um, reigns. And we managed to really very, very quickly get things moving. The three most important elements for us looking forward, I will start with this last one, is really European solidarity and capacity building. Um, we've seen and we're seeing that diseases know no borders and a in a closely integrated Europe, we really have to deal with health threats and other important health issues based on close collaboration and common purpose. Um, the other speakers mentioned it as well, more solidarity is really needed to support member states in strengthening their healthcare systems and their public health capacities in order to achieve more preparedness and common preparedness as well as equal access to healthcare and um, comparable outcomes for patients. We also need to have reinforced capacities um, at the research level so that we are the best um, prepared. We have the right research ecosystem um, that is able to produce research, um, the kind of solutions we're looking for today. We're looking for vaccines, we're looking for treatments. You can't switch on and off the research ecosystem. Um, Europe is extremely yeah. strong already. We have a fantastic uh, network of universities and research hospitals. And we really need to make sure we have all the right incentives to continue that, to, to, to breed that innovation. And looking into uh, manufacturing, uh, also if we could look into advanced manufacturing, biomanufacturing, in 2030, it's estimated about 50% of all medicines will be um, bio-based, if you like. And it's important that Europe uh, looks into our capacity for research, development, and manufacturing of these medicines. And as you know, for example, vaccines are mostly um, biologicals as well. And we also need as Europe, within this European solidarity, which is my first point, we need this reinforced capacity to monitor and assess national and regional healthcare needs. It, it really is important. It will inform the supply of medicines in general, essential medicines, medical equipment, but also in cases of health threats like now and, and also other healthcare resources. We need to address health inequalities uh, within member states as well as among member states. Um, and, and not forgetting, and we've seen it in this crisis, also the needs of marginalized communities such as homeless and migrants. So that would be my first, European solidarity and capacities would be my first thing. The second one for us, I think it clearly came home that we have in Europe, uh, the funding of healthcare is very piecemeal, it's in silos. And we really need now when we get up from this crisis, but even as we go through it, an integrated approach to the funding of healthcare. Uh, to a large extent, as I mentioned, national healthcare systems are still quite fragmented. 
they operate on annual budgets um, and the value of long-term benefits and health investments are not really assessed or considered when evaluating individual health intervention. And this crisis is really an opportunity to design a new way of financing healthcare systems based on an integrated budget, um, including health and social care, so both elements. Uh, and, and this would provide really the right incentives to direct um, investments into prevention, into services, into technologies that bring benefits in the longer term. And it would also free up resources in other parts not of the system. So, yeah. I'm not quite sure whether you're hearing me. Um, um, you, you're sort of, you know, making a co-speech. Uh, we, we had been talking about two minutes, and I think we got your most important point. I mean, um, point. We're running a bit low. Yeah, I mean, I want with everything, so, that's okay. so um, rather, let's uh, address uh, with different uh, interview partners uh, three aspects: uh, strategic independence uh, of Europe. Now, uh, of course, uh, we've heard that from all of you reflected. Uh, we need to become more independent. Um, Natalie said we've got to be transparent. We've got to have a strengthening of the health system. Uh, however, um, uh, and I'll switch back to uh, German. Ms. Pfeiffer, you said at the beginning that there are things we would like to have, but that we also need to be able to afford them. How much independence do we need in Europe, and can we afford it? It's somewhat difficult when we speak about the question of sites. Of course, we want to ensure that the provision of pharmaceuticals is secured in the European member states. But the question is, do we have to talk about whether pharmaceuticals need to be produced in Europe? I'm an economist, and I was always taught that free trade uh, leads to increased wealth for everyone. So I'm somewhat difficult to favor a local isolation. But at a European level, we need to consider how can we ensure that um, we know where the production is and we need to be transparent as to where the production sites are and the companies must also be forced to monitor and to be transparent towards the member states as to where the possible problems lie. And then we must also consider where replacement could be available. It doesn't make sense to say, OK, we're going to favor production in Europe with a lot of money. If, on the other hand, we had the possibility to say, regardless where it is being produced, it needs to be ensured that this production is up and running, that we know when there are issues, and that there is a, a plan B if an active ingredient is missing at one spot. Because if there are technical issues, for example, then production in Europe will be of no use either. Well, business as usual no longer exists, and probably is not going to be expected over the next years. Should we overcome the pandemic? Well, there will always be a question mark. But perhaps, unfortunately, the speaker is no longer audible. There seems to be connection issues. And it was said that Europe needs to become more independent. Now the question is how and to what degree should the Commission be instrumental in this? Perhaps, Mr. Wölken, you could start, and then Mr. Siedl, you could perhaps add something to it. Thank you very much. I hope this technically works. I did not understand 100% of what you said. But in my opinion, we need to take a closer look at two things in the future. First of all, the appeal that when it comes to the development of um, especially antibiotics, we need to impose more pressure. That is my appeal to the European Commission. Please do something in the framework of the pharma strategy here. And now secondly, we still have an open file, 
and that's the Common Health and Technology Assessment, which in itself uh, demonstrates value added. And with the HDR regulation, if it had already been passed, we would have had a much faster exchange between the different HDA sites. That would have been a value added for the citizens when it comes to the distribution of uh, resources that are missing. This has been alluded to a number of times. I think the pandemic really showed that cooperation in matters health is more important than ever before. But nevertheless, the member states uh, are still having difficulties to uh, put in the next gear here. In the area of HDA, we are still discussing the same problems, i.e. what are the majority relations, where can more information be requested, what's the scope, etc. And for me, to be honest, that is not understandable. Against the background of the current situation, it cannot be that we still do not have progress here. So my appeal is, please, let's uh, shift gears and get going. Uh, Mr. Zide, we have different lists of essential pharmaceuticals that should be stocked, but these are national lists and not harmonized lists. Do we need harmonized lists for the whole of Europe? It's a matter of both. And if if you look at uh, the matter of potential bottlenecks, well, there's a report with 121 points. It's a whole list of wishes. But we are triggering a process here, a process which is only just starting, where we want to bring developments into a direction which, in the long term, should increase security, but we also need European awareness here. I've always said that in reality, we also need a stronger political signal of the parliament. The committee within the parliament should really ask itself the question, what are the lessons learned from the pandemic? What lessons have we learned? And the resolution is a part of this. But uh, there are going to be a number of puzzle pieces that need to be brought together. There's not going to be one size fits all. It is a matter of both here. And we need to also improve our setups at national levels. And then we need to ensure that we have European solidarity in order to also reduce bottlenecks. Of my question. Um, one of the questions, of course, behind it is uh, can Europe become independent? And the question is can the pharma industry actually do it? Can they produce more in Europe? Uh, and then, of course, the question is I'm quite sure it will be at a cost. Uh, so, what do your members say? I'm really sorry, I can't hear anything in the translation, so I wasn't able to follow the last two speakers. Um, could you repeat your question, please? Uh, my, my question was basically, uh, can the industry actually do it, i.e. sort of bring more of the production sites uh, back to Europe, uh, maybe shorten uh, some supply chains? Um, uh, what is the response like? Is it possible technically? And B, at what cost? I think, as I mentioned in my introduction, um, for the innovative industry, there is no need to move API production to Europe because we already produce 77% of our API in Europe and 11% in the US. So um, I think the question is difficult for me to answer. Our supply chains are extremely resilient. We don't need to shorten them. We diversify them. Um, and when we have pandemic preparedness plans in place, like we set them up in December, we managed to increase production by 400 to 800% without needing um, to change any in any way or try and produce API in Europe. So I think it's different parts of the healthcare um, supply chain will have different challenges. 
as far as the innovative pharmaceutical industry, that's not the key issue. As I mentioned in my introduction, I think what's important is to decide what manufacturing we want in Europe. Um, biomanufacturing, so is probably the future of pharmaceuticals, and we could strengthen our uh, capacity to manufacture biopharmaceuticals more in Europe with the right incentive and the right research ecosystem. Thank you. I, I get the impression that the members of parliaments and uh, you, Natalie, um, talk about a different kind of transparency when you talk about transparency, but maybe uh, there's something that we can uh, reflect in the next round. Um, let's now talk about the urgency of action, uh, of the, about the urgency um, of actually uh, getting uh, new laws passed. Uh, and damit drehe ich mich wiederum zu Frau Pfeiffer. I'm going to turn back to you, Pfeiffer. The pharma strategy, which is going to be published next month, is not only a response to Corona. Such a strategy requires time to build up. But it is true that it is very timely now due to Corona. Would you say that we now must urgently obtain new legislative dossiers, or are we able to design the next years in a sufficient manner with what we have? Well, I'd like to get back to the points that have already been alluded to. We require transparency transparency as to where what is being produced, and especially where the issues lie. That is a decisive factor. If we have production issues at one point, then there must be an obligation to inform, thus allowing for a corresponding reaction. Only that way can replacement production take place. That is something we would wish for. We would wish for companies themselves to be able to or have to even have replacement production to ensure that the security of supply is ensured. So for this, we need monitoring at a EU level to ensure that we can find out if there are issues at an early point in time. So here we really require fast action. I have heard that we have some technical difficulties aware that there are a couple of technical problems right at the moment. All our technicians are working uh, at getting things done, so um, that's why I'm, I'm sticking to English right at the moment, because I've heard that the German translation uh, is uh, just lost for the time being. Uh, but that's quite uh, uh, quite useful, because uh, the next person I'd like to address is uh, uh, Sylvain uh, and also uh, Timo. Now, the question is, uh, we've already heard about the HGA uh, the health uh, technology uh, assessment. And it seems that that's uh, one of the, the, the core uh, areas um, where, where things are not as smooth as they could be as yet. Uh, so uh, maybe, Silva, um, what are the next steps? Okay, can you hear uh, me, uh, Connie? Yeah, now we can hear you. Now we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so you, you, you'd you like me to speak on uh, HTA, on health technology assessment, is that right? Or do you want me to also intervene on this idea of, of dependency and then addressing uh, security of supply or both? So I don't know. You Use your intervention for both. Okay, well, I try to be very short. I think in a nutshell, when it comes to HGA, uh, is that certainly we believe, I mean, in the, in the Commission, quite obviously, we do believe that uh, this uh, proposal that we've made and which is still uh, being discussed between the two co-legislators uh, um, uh, uh, would uh, in, uh, certainly uh, have, had, uh, have had played a role if it had been in place uh, during this crisis as well, because uh, it does contribute to these broader objectives uh, of... of uh, of uh, strengthening cooperation on, and uh, if we'd had a joint clinical assessments done in a way that would be more cooperative uh, and then supporting member states in taking evidence-based decision uh, on access to new medicines and, and uh, the different things that so this would have certainly um, uh, ensured uh, uh, evidence generation uh, in a way that uh, could have played a role also in the current crisis. Um, 
but uh, so I'd, I'd, I'd say no more on 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 HGA. I guess uh, the discussions are ongoing now between the co-legislators, and and they would need they need to be um, a continuing, and and we are looking forward to more good cooperation between institutions on the issue of. Um, independence and you know there are many words that are being used a lot of rhetorics around words and and sometimes words are used interchangeably but they don't mean the same thing if you say uh, sovereignty if you say independence if you say um uh, reshoring production uh, if you say security of supply if you say diversification of sources you're not necessarily saying the same thing what uh, we're lucky enough in the commission because we're being told by the other institutions what to do or well, not always we like this idea, but uh, here we have very clear mandates uh, and requests made to us by the uh, other institutions on this uh, subject. We have uh, the European Council on the 2nd of October that really clearly said that achieving strategic autonomy while preserving an open economy is a key objective of the union. And the Council, the European Council, the heads of states and government asked very specifically the Commission to identify strategic dependencies and vulnerabilities in the supply chain for health products. They have asked to propose measures to reduce these dependencies, including by, and they, there are three different blocks of measures that uh, we would need to be considering, diversifying production and supply chain, ensuring strategic stockpiling, and fostering production and investment in Europe. We also lucky enough because the European Parliament also very recently issued a policy paper with a very detailed and comprehensive analysis of the measures that could be considered to ensure and improve the security of supply in Europe. This resolution was adopted in September by the European Parliament. Um, so with our uh, pharmaceutical strategy that we're going to uh, publish soon, I mentioned that already, we're going to address some of these uh, issues. Uh, we're going to be looking at indeed how vulnerable is our, our, our supply chain. Our, at the moment, we're not yet very clear about the diagnostics, the facts, the evidence. We hear a lot about the need to repatriate, to reshore, but we need to build the evidence and we need to understand what are the critical aspects of the supply chain uh, that create dependencies if there are dependencies in the different steps and the different types of uh, uh, stages in the production of pharmaceutical. So this ne ne necessarily will have to be the first step in in, in, in any work to gain a better understanding of the supply chain and identify vulnerabilities. And it's only on this basis that we could then be looking at measures. And of course, there are different types of measures, um, legislative measures. Do we need to reinforce obligations for the companies uh, to supply products uh, and, to, um, and to report uh, potential uh, bottlenecks? Do we need to increase the cooperation between member states, authorities on the way they purchase and they procure products in a way that they can actually also use these instruments to secure supply. What type of financial incentives could be coming from the European authorities to support potential manufacturing at EU level? What type of international cooperation do we want to have with our trade partners to globally increase the quality of the uh, production standards, uh, also their environmentally, their environmental and sustainability, uh, and and. Of course, the question that I heard already asked, uh, which is like, if there was to be financial incentive, who would have to pay? And how would we, would we be making sure that this is good investment for the public authorities? Clearly, there will be a cost because if um, a production left Europe of, for certain products or, or basic materials, it was because there was a commercial interest to leave Europe uh, and because there was some uh, cheaper standards to be very clear in other countries that uh, led to a better uh, profitable uh, production uh, elsewhere and reduced production costs. So if there was to be production brought back to Europe, that would have to mean someone has to pay the, the cost and probably public authorities would have to pay the cost. But this would need to be factored into a policy a process by which public authorities actually benefit and that these that is actually serving overall public interest and uh, health objectives um, so this uh, value for money should be cost costed appropriately and it should be very clear that um, 
<clears throat> public authorities don't have to pay twice or would not have to pay twice. Uh, I mean, when they finance manufacturing lines in the first plane or would finance. And at the end of the process, when they reimburse medicines that could potentially be more expensive. So the EPA resolution I mentioned is actually going through different um, considerations around that. And actually, the, the parliament is, is saying something which I think is, is very important and which will also be guiding us in the commission is that financial incentives would have to be in return for a certain number of commitments from those that uh, receive the financial incentives. That's where Sugar, I start. Sorry. Uh, we'll, uh, continue uh, in a moment. Uh, thank you very much for, for that sort of uh, very passionate uh, statement. Could I just, before I ask the, uh, the parliamentarians, and could we just for a moment stick to English simply because I hear or uh, I, I uh, get that the German isn't coming across very well. Um, could I just go back to Natalie? I mean, the way that I understood your last statement was actually there is no problem. We have enough production here in Europe. Correct? Um, so for us, it's not that we have enough production here in Europe, it's not that we don't, or we don't depend on for others from other parts of the world, because we produce most of our API here. Uh, we can increase, we increase production, and that's globally, of course, by uh, hundreds of percent um, as needed. But, it, but I did say, I did caution, this is the innovative industry I'm talking about. I can't talk on behalf of all the other industries that have been involved in the crisis, uh, whether it's um, you know the medical device industry or, or other parts of the pharmaceutical chain. So um, I can only obviously respond on, on on what what we've been facing. The shortages we avoided all shortages during the COVID nineteen crisis so far, and the issues we had was with the supply of medicines, making sure we knew where to send our medicines when because we didn't have transparency we didn't we were not able to see the patient needs in the country some countries were stockpiling other countries had actual needs and it was very difficult for companies to understand what was what and where to send products but i think the great news is that we were able to avoid shortages because we have these pandemic preparedness plans in place since december and we were able to produce from four to eight hundred percent uh, more product and not just COVID-19 related product or product uh, in, in the right framework of time, for time frame. Like I said, this is the innovative industry I'm talking about. I can't speak for other industries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalie. Um, and I'd now like uh, uh, the two parliamentarians to sort of comment uh, on what you've just heard uh, by Natalie and uh, by Sylvain. Uh, maybe uh, seeing that we are uh, in uh, Brussels or seeing that you are in Brussels, um, maybe you could respond in English. A again, uh, I fear that we would otherwise be losing uh, some people um, that do not have access uh, to to the German link. Timo? Yeah, 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 of course. Uh, no, no problem at all. Um, so I would like to make one point on diversifying the supply chain. Um, as Ms. Moll said, in regards to API, it mainly concerns the generics. Uh, but the point I want to make is that, in my opinion, it should not be about uh, moving already existing factories to the European Union, but to make sure that there is more uh, than one uh, available in case something happens uh, to one of the other factories. So uh, this is how we can make the uh, supply chain more resilient. Um, this way we can secure a better supply as we would always have to product uh, as we, had, as we uh, would always have two production um, places. So uh, I mean I really um, I already said that there was chaos in the beginning of the crisis. This is also the reason we need better communication and a possible database where we have an overview of the stock of medicines available on the market. This way there could be better uh, coordination between member states if and when shortages happen. Just to mention two things as you ask uh, us to be shorter. 
<laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, and with that, uh, that one, uh, Dr. Siedl, uh, maybe also, um, sorry, maybe also in English. Because uh, so many things are, are still said, and so for me it's very important that we have now a focus uh, on these topics, uh, but we also have to be sure that the focus is also on the topic, for example, one or two years after the, the pandemic uh, crisis and the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And so uh, I think we have a, we have to good, uh, we have a good uh, basic from the Parliament, the report of the Parliament, and there will be the, the Commission strategy uh, and uh, for me, it's also very important. There will, there, will, there will be different measures. For me, it's very important how we finance uh, the things. I think it would be a very political question after um, the pandemic crisis, uh, especially for the, the member states. That means uh, the Commission also has to say how we, how we, uh, they, they think how we sh should finance uh, all these measures. French, I've just heard that the German sound is available again. So perhaps a quick statement of yours, after which, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to ask you, by using the slider tool, which you hopefully all know already. Now, after what you've heard, perhaps a last comment. I can only echo what Timo Wölken has said. What's decisive is the question of the diversity of production. It's not about having one specific production site. There must be the possibility to substitute. And one important point that was also alluded to is the, factor, the matter that we do not have a discussion as to pharmaceuticals because we have a pandemic. This discussion is a lot older. And the HDA directive has been alluded to. We want to ensure that pharmaceuticals are judged as to their usage for patients. And in this context, we are also discussing the questions what subsidies exist for industries to develop pharmaceutical products. And we need a good audit here. What we have noticed is that the pharmaceuticals that are being offered are focusing on smaller and smaller patent groups and well here we have uh, different uh, subsidy structures that must be examined by the EU to ensure that uh, the question of usage favors patients. Thank you very much. We're somewhat running late. Nevertheless, I would like all of our viewers to take part in the Slido questionnaire. We have mentioned five points. Perhaps the colleagues in Brussels could share the screen. That's the one. So you have two possibilities of ac accessing Slido. If you already know it, simply use your mobile phone to scan the QR code. Alternatively, you can go onto Slido dot com and then enter the hashtag and the number three nine eight nine zero after that you will see the following multiple choice question one person has already voted which is why you see the strange result here but the question is of course how can access to high quality and affordable medicines be safeguarded across europe in 10 years time Now this always takes a bit of time until the ladies and gentlemen have logged in and have voted. So again, the first uh, reply is a matter of having a digital network to create more tra market transparency. Number two was a stronger role and more competences for the EU in health policy. Then there's the matter of the common development of critical pharmaceuticals. 
and then there's a reshoring production back to Europe, and last but not least, the joint procurement and stockpiling of critical drones. Now, whilst you continue to vote, Sylvain. There, there is this vision of uh, a, um, a health union. Um, is that a vision that we need? Is that a vision that we live? And maybe could you just sort of give a quick answer on that whilst everybody is completing their poll? Thank you. Thank well, well I, I, I guess it, it would be difficult for me not to say that this is what we need uh, from where I speak in the European Commission. This is definitely <laughs> something that we feel is needed and more cooperation and more solidarity and a better understanding of how we can uh, work together uh, across the EU on health issues. Our member states, uh, contrary to what they sometimes believe, uh, they uh, have similar challenges when it comes to health. Of course, there are different situations. Of course, their health systems are organized differently. Of course, they have uh, uh, different um, uh, 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 ways to address health issues. But at the end of the day, they are confronted to the same challenges and working together, learning from each other um, does, not, um, uh, does not deprive them from their national competence. It's very also important to uh, say that. It's not because it's a national competence that you can't actually discuss your national national competency with other member states and, and work further. So unfortunately, it takes this crisis to realize that um, in certain areas. So as far as the Commission is concerned, as the President of the Commission said in the uh, State of the Union speech, we want to continue pushing for uh, cooperation. We want to continue pushing for developing all the tools that are available, that whether they are legislative, where they are non-legislative, where they are financial, uh, to develop further this uh, Health Union. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, the colleagues in Brussels. Now, esteemed colleagues in Brussels, could we perhaps see the result of our Slido poll? Perhaps we could share it with all of the viewers. If you could share your screen. Right. It is clear almost 50% are in favor of increased transparency, more visibility, and that we require digital help to achieve this. Now, this is the impression of our viewers. I will not ask you to comment this result, but perhaps all of you could give me only a brief sentence. What are we talking about? And maybe sort of, you know, one or two sentences. Where do you hope we are in five years um, as far as uh, our core questions are concerned? Thank you, Connie. So I hope that in five years we have a European, European health Europe infrastructure. I hope that we have an integrated approach to funding healthcare uh, within member states and maybe even more integrated at European level. And I, I hope that our European solidarity um, is very clear and we have the right incentives in Europe to ensure a strong research ecosystem that makes us a world leader in innovation. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Günther Siedl and Timur Reiten, bitte. In five years, it is important that we will have achieved massive progress in terms of research and development in Europe, and that we will have further developed everything that is still in its infancy. This relates to the mobility of citizens, international trade too, and this also includes the pharmaceutical products. But with regards to our network, we are still in our infancy, so the process must be triggered for something concrete to happen. Thank you very much indeed. Mr. Duncan. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I hope that in five years we have accomplished a European health union founded on the principle of solidarity and that the member states realize that the most important thing isn't subsidiarity, but uh, making sure that every European has access to high quality 
uh, medicines. Fantastic. Silva, in five years' time. Yeah, so, sorry, uh, yeah. can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, the, yes. Well, I'd say, um, you know, like the other speakers, uh, certainly uh, what what's needed is that uh, in five years' times, we'll actually have progressed uh, so much that uh, a crisis like the one we are facing now, we would be able to handle collectively and in solidarity, and not just for the sake of solidarity, but because it is our in our interest to be working together. Uh, I hope that uh, in five years' times, we will, or, or uh, have comforted our health systems and comforted the idea that health protection and social protection is a fundamental element of our uh, economic and social model and that it should be continued. And then we will also have uh, progressed on uh, uh, ensuring availability, accessibility, affordability of uh, uh, medicinal products uh, across the, the continent. Lovely. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Pfeiffer, you have the last statement. I hope that in five years, in the whole of Europe, there will be significant subsidies for developing drugs that are actually of benefit to our patients. And, uh, that it is also proved that it can be proved that the industry has an interest in producing things that are of the utmost benefits for patients. Thank you very much for being so brief, ladies and gentlemen. As you can see, I'm taking a look at our agenda. We did manage to discuss our points. I know that uh, there might have been some sound issues. We do ask for your forgiveness for this. Two different sites via video conference isn't the very easiest, but the European project, as well as a functioning healthcare system, as well as a pharmaceutical market that works in favor of everyone is just as difficult as uh, the technology required for such a conference. We're now going to take a longer break. We are going to be back at 2 p.m. At 2 p.m. we'll be taking a look at another topic. We'll have many guests with different people dialed in. And Mr. Schmidt, the European Commissioner for Social Affairs, is also going to partake. And we're going to discuss the question of social insurance for those people who aren't a part of the normal system, in inverted commas, but might be platform or gig workers. In these times, this is certainly a topic uh, that requires uh, our utmost attention. As for the pharmaceutical market, we have touched upon many aspects in our discussion. Thank you very much once again for allowing us to be here. I would like to thank the colleagues in Brussels too from wherever you have dialed in. Thank you very much for partaking. Let's all ensure that we get through the second phase of the corona crisis in the best possible way. Hopefully there will be learnings from the first phase. All of this to ensure that we better manage the second wave. See you later and thank you very much for partaking thus far.